Right. Hi everyone. So welcome to the first uh, DTB seminar, Changing Planet Seminar for 2018. Um, this is our third one of the academic year as well. Um, and we're very lucky today to have uh, an amazing speaker. I've seen some of his talks before, obviously, um, in that we have Charles Godfrey here, uh, Professor Charles Godfrey. He's um, a, so a bit about his background. He's a population biologist who has interests in environmental science. Um, he's worked on numerous things from epidemiology to ecology and evolution as well. Um, Professor Sir Charles Godfrey is the co professor of zoology at Jesus College, Oxford. Um, uh, Charles has also just recently taken up a position as the director of the Oxford Martin uh, Program and is the school um, on the future of food. And we're actually welcoming, welcoming back Charles to Imperial College because he studied here um, as a PhD and a postdoc researcher and a lecturer as well. Um, he's now full, uh, fully based at Oxford. And um, just a few more things. He was awarded the Scientific Medal in 1904, the Frank Medal in 2009, and Charles is also a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, and Charles has been awarded the CVE and knighted last year as well. And so it is with great pleasure um, that I introduce Charles to you all today uh, for a very interesting talk. And uh, let's give him a hand. Thanks very much for that overkind introduction. Um, but it is an enormous pleasure to be back I at Imperial. I spent 25 years of my life here. And obviously, my primary loyalty is with Oxford now. But if Oxford's not involved, then I'm very much an imperial person. <laughs> and it's uh, great looking around the audience at old friends here. Um, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is some interdisciplinary work that we've been doing at Oxford um, within the context of uh, the Oxford Martin School. And the, at the Oxford Martin School, we have a, a brief to sort of do things which have a solution at the end, so really driven by problems rather than fundamental science, and they have to be interdis uh, interdisciplinary. And this work also came out of work that I did as part of the Foresight Project, a Foresight Project that John Beddington, another uh, Imperial alumnus now at, uh, at Oxford, uh, organised when he was Government Chief Scientific Advisor. So. Um, I'm a population biologist, and being a population biologist, the, the sort of founder of my field is Thomas Malthus, this sort of, uh, also one of the founders of economics, um, a slightly dyspeptic 18th century vicar who didn't like the French women, the working classes, but <laughs> set, set the groundwork for several topics. And one of the things that you'll all know about him from his essays of population was that he, writing at the time of the French Revolution, actually a time of great optimism for most people, but not uh, the Reverend Malthus, um, and he was predicting that by the early decades of the 19th century, that essentially the world population would run out of food. And he's very eloquent about that in his essays. And this didn't happen because of the Industrial Revolution, which had complex effects, increase the technology available, and it changed the structure of the labour force, pulling a lot of people off the land, <coughs> engendering greater um, productivity, labour productivity. And so, to a certain extent, then food went off the political agenda, um, at, at least systemic food, the issues with food. We still had crises such as the, uh, the um, famine mid-century in Ireland. And it was um, towards the middle of the 20th century that we had the second of what might be called a wave of Malthusian pessimism. And this happened when I was a student in the late 70s. And we had the Club of Rome, and we had Paul Ehrlich's Population Bomb. And um, I reread Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb. Uh, how many of the youngsters here know about this book, The Population Bomb? So for Gordon Conway here, of course, mm. does some things. But for people in my generation, I'm in my late 50s now, this is a revolutionary book. And he's very much in the field, in the, in the um, vein of Malthusian pessimism, and re reading it recently, uh, I was shocked. Ehrlich was saying that there would not be democracy in Europe by the turn of the century because of food riots and things. And of course, the reason why that didn't happen was the Green Revolution. That Gordon Conway, who I'm delighted to see in the audience, was one of the people who was instrumental uh, in that. And so we got out of the second wave of Malthusian pessimism because of the Green Revolution. And the third wave essentially is happening around now, and in particular during the food price spikes 
of a few years back, 2008, 2010. And food rocketed back up the political agenda. And people were asking, is, is it possible, even with a demographic transition occurring and population growth decelerating, is there a real risk that we will run out of food, that we will be unable to feed a global population of 9 to 10 billion people in the second half uh, of this, this century? And this is just the, uh, some data from the third wave here. This is the FAO food price index. Um, normally it's given as deflated, but economists point out that actually deflating food prices by US inflation is not perhaps the best way of doing it if you're a smallholder or an urban dweller in Africa. In some ways the nominal price is more relevant. So if you sort of think of it between those two lines, that is the volatility and increase in food prices that you've been experiencing uh, over, over the last decade. And so many people now have been looking at some of the, the challenges that are happening at the moment. I do apologise for those of you on, on the left. We're only working on one, uh, on one um, uh, projector. Uh, so the issue of continuing demand growth, so gro growing, growing global population, and a global population that is richer, which is a good thing, but of course richer people demand food, demand diets that are more rich in resource-hungry food, in particular livestock. We are seeing, and again, many of you will be familiar with this, but I still think it's largely under the policy radar in many quarters, this enormous trend to urbanisation and the growth of megacities. And I'll be coming back to that at the end of the talk. We have the continuing issues of hunger and undernutrition, but we must also be aware of the fabulous progress that we've made on hunger and urban and uh, undernutrition. By no means have we got rid of it, but yet the Millennium Development Goals, the one on hunger, was one of the few ones that was largely met. But although there's been this progress, although much more progress is needed in hunger and undernutrition, then out of nowhere we have this epidemic of obesity that is att uh, affecting not only the rich world, but increasingly middle-income countries and increasingly low-income countries. It's amazing if you go to Africa today and you look at the emerging African middle classes issues around uh, obesity there, and major problems, as you know, in the, uh, in the developed world. And we have increasing pressures on agriculture, water scarcity, as John Beddington used to say when he was government chief scientist, is probably the one that's going to rear up and bite us first. Competition for land, soil de degradation. And then we have the issues around resilience, of course climate change, but also the resilience to human generated shocks. And again, that's something that I want to come back to at the end. So that is the framing for what I'm going to talk about in this, in this talk. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, first of all, talk about some of the research that we've been doing at Oxford, led by a really talented team, of which I, I'm one very small part, <coughs> and I'll introduce them in a moment. And I want to ask three questions, and then describe our inter interdisciplinary effort to explore the future. I'm then going to say something very briefly on what I think are science priorities, just one slide. And that's to a certain extent to try and, and generate, perhaps, discussion. And then I want to finish by what keeps me awake at night. So people say, well, what worries you about the food system sort of going uh, um, in the next decade? So I want to focus on what I think is the thing that, that concerns me most. So I'm going to ask three questions, and I'm going to answer them using a suite of models, connected models, which I'm not going to describe in any detail beyond this uh, picture here and uh, just show how they are connected. And this is a collaboration between people at Oxford and people at the International Food Policy Research Institute, one of the part of the CG system based in, um, in um, Washington. Uh, I'm not going to mention the old men down the bottom, which includes me, but I will mention the person who's led this work, which is an incredibly talented uh, postdoc based in Oxford called Marco Springman, and his equivalent in IFRI, Daniel Mason de Cruz, who's just moved to CSIRO. So I will be using that weird pronoun, the professorial we, 
which you should translate into essentially Marco or Marco and Daniel. And what we've done is, uh, so what IFBRI have is they have one of the major economic models, technically a partial equilibrium model, which they can use to ask questions of the food system. And that takes exogenous drivers, the yellow boxes, such as climate <coughs> models, population scenarios, socioeconomic models. That it takes that as, um, as uh, exogenous inputs. And then it has endogenously a crop model, a water use model, and an economic model. And the economic model, the guts of it, has the sort of the complex elasticity, so if prices goes up, what does that do for diets? The cross elasticity says the price of meat goes up, what if you eat, what do you eat instead? So it's one of the sort of four or five major partial equilibrium models of the food system that, that exists at the moment. And we have coupled that with a model that's been developed at the Department of Public Health in, um, in Oxford, which can take a diet and then express the diet as a vector and then look at health outcomes. And these health outcomes are the non-communicable diseases that, um, that are associated with different diets. And this is based on sort of rigorous statistical epidemiology. And what we've also been doing, this is largely Marco's work, is including environmental outcomes. And today I'll only be talking about greenhouse gas emissions. What we're doing at the moment is to try and make that broader. And I want to say a little bit about some of the economic consequences. So this is the modeling uh, superstructure underlying what I'll be talking about. And I'll say nothing more about it. And I, I guess I would just sort of have a caveat to begin with. So I'm a modeler in the biological sciences. And I guess, especially in this building here, being at Imperial, I spent most of my career looking over my shoulder in fear and awe at the physicists who sort of modeling and, you know, they have parameters to 20 decimal places and things. And it's a real joy to work with economists because they have to make even more heroic assumptions than we do in biology. <laughs> and in some sense, I'm sort of trying to persuade you not to believe anything I say because they are modeling. But there is no other way of asking questions about these complex, non-linear, social, natural science, um, natural science questions. And in essence, one of the function of models is to sort of set down your assumptions and to work through to a conclusion. And if you don't believe what I say, and as I said, I'm encouraging you not to believe it, then engage with the model to say where we're wrong. So in many cases, the function of the model is not to make predictions it's to try and help us understand the processes. So let me go to the first of the three questions. And this is, what if we eat healthily? And by that I mean, what is if we, and to a certain extent it's an academic question, but I think it sort of circumscribes a space within which policy can op operate. What if we eat healthily? And by that, what I'm, what happens if, by 2050, the world adopts diets recommended by the World Health Organization? And these are recommendations that talk about the um, amount of meat you eat, the amount of, the, of fruit and vegetables you eat. And what we do is we implement these, I hope, in a relatively sophisticated way. So we don't assume people in every country will go to a single diet. We take current diets in each of the major countries in the world, and then we modify them in the most likely way that you would get a transition to a WHO recommended diet. And so what we do is we do that, and we put it through the economic model, so that we look at what is going to happen if you move to greater demand for one type of food, and we work through the economic consequences of that, which may affect the prices. Uh, of, of other food. And then we do that and we calculate diet-related disease deaths using the epidemiological-based health model that the Oxford Group have developed. And then we look at greenhouse gas emissions using the type of data compilations that various people, including the FAO, have brought together. And we begin to explore the economics. And I'll show you some preliminary results we have on the economic side, but they really are preliminary. So, so that's the sort of organizing question that we ask. And I'm going to be showing some maps of the world. 
And of course, doing a map of the world, I went to the Foreign Office to get the latest Foreign Office approved map. <laughs> and looking at it very carefully, we weren't completely convinced by the geography and the position of the UK. So we altered it back <laughs> to what we thought was the correct geography. And as I said, what if we need health needs? So what are the consequences of, of, of this? So um, what we calculate through this is that if we transition to a healthy diet, then there would be each year 5 million avoided deaths. Now, uh, and I'm just going to talk about mortality here. We're trying to make it a bit more sophisticated using DALI, the, the um, term that takes into account disability adjusted life years. But I'm just going to stick to deaths per year here. And of course, what does that figure mean? So the, the, the other thing my lab does is we study the mosquitoes that transmit malaria. And the number of people who die per year from malaria is half a million. And that's the most important roundabout of tuberculosis infectious disease. Now, I, I use that statistic uh, with, with uh, caution because um, it, it's a horrible statistic to me. But I think that grounds a little bit what we're talking about. And again, it's a bit different because malarial deaths tend to be young, where these deaths uh, tend to be old, uh, older. But if we were able to transition to WHO healthy diets, one would get a benefit that would be the equivalent of, um, of curing malaria many times over. So there is a, a really great potential benefit to get uh, there if we could get diets right. But it's even better than that because there are co-benefits. So if we look at the greenhouse gas emissions or transitioning to a healthy diet, then the adaption of that diet would mean that greenhouse gas emissions associated with the food system would not increase by 50%, which is what business as usual expects. They would only increase by 7%. So that's a real benefit of greenhouse gases. Now, of course, you will say that it's not a question of reducing growth. We must uh, uh, reverse it. But this is just the diet-related component. Before you do all the other things you can do with agriculture in, uh, in, in mitigation. So you get a very big greenhouse gas um, benefit from this transition to a healthy diet. And one thing I would point out is that the greens are where greenhouse gases will go down. But there are areas, specifically in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where the model predicts that actually, if you were transitioning to the diet that the WHO recommends, then you would expect the greenhouse gas emissions to go up. And in fact, you would want the greenhouse gas emissions to go up because you want these people to have better diets. Now, of course, on top of that, you can do things to try and mitigate it. But again, the message here, and this is very much an old message, is that we need to do more in the rich world to help the development, to allow, rather, the development in low and middle income, uh, well, low income countries in this case. So transitioning to adopting a WHO recommended diet has clear health benefits, as you'd expect, clear co-benefits with uh, the environment. What about economics? Well, here's a sort of toe in the water to try and look at the, uh, the effects. And up here is benefits in US trillion dollars. And if one looks at the carbon dioxide, the reductions in CO2 emissions, and calculate the social cost of carbon, then one's getting economic benefits of about that order there. These are not real error bars. We just ran the model using different uh, assumptions. So it's a measure of variability rather than, rather than anything else. And then if you look at the health consequences, so fewer people getting these cardiovascular diseases from the diet-associated cancers, and you look at the direct health costs to different health systems, which varies depending on the country, then you get figures that are going up to about 0.5 US trillion dollars per year and the purple edition up there are the knock-on effects from loss of earnings and the consequences to balance. So again I wouldn't want to defend these very very hard but there's some indication of the economic benefits. 
Now, I suspect there's some economists in the room who will know far more about some of the other ways you can, some of the hedonic measures or values of saved lives and things. And again, this gets very hard. The assumptions you have to make to make these calculations become pretty heroic. But if you use some of the methodologies for how people value saved lives in different parts of the world, then you're getting really quite enormous figures, eight trillion US per year, and you probably can't see down the base, but the gross national product of the gross domestic product of the world is eighty trillion dollars. So you're getting up, you know, ten percent of global GDP in as much as you believe these figures. I think the take home message is that we are talking big numbers economically as well as greenhouse gas emissions and health in terms of uh, of increased lifespan were one to get diets right. So that's the first of the three questions I want to ask using these suite of, of models. And the second one is how will climate change affect diet related mortality? So if you recall we were driving the economic model which then drove the health model and the environment model using uh, different socioeconomic and um, climate models and things. And so what we did was we took a scenario that will result in two degrees global warming. So one of the scenarios that, that hopefully the world will not exceed. And then using the plant growth models and the water models that are coupled to IFBRI, we were able to then model the effects of climate change on food production. And then it works through prices and diets to see how this affects what people actually consume. Again, with all those assumptions along the way, but just to remind them, the reason why we do these models is to try and come up with at least a benchmark we can criticize. And the previous study that had tried to do this, which was a desk-based study rather than a modeling study, was by WHO, who suggested that there might be 85 thousand extra deaths per year with the same scenario by mid-century um, due to climate change and diet. So they largely, through expert judgment, <coughs> they said, well, we expect climate to have this effect. Their diets will change in this way. We expect deaths to go up or down as a consequence of those diets uh, diet change. Add them up and we go to 85 thousand. So that's uh, the sort of previous benchmark. So these are the results we got. And let's first start off with no diet change. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, with no climate change. And if we are looking ahead and we compare mortality to the mortality we expect today, then because, largely because people are becoming wealthier and they were able to afford a better diet, we would expect that just if one takes these sort of standard OECD economic scenarios, people will be coming out of hunger, and that compared with what would exist today, with a larger population, the avoided deaths would be nearly two million people. And again, this is part of the good news of hunger, largely driven by economic growth and people coming out of poverty. That um, the background is that we're, we're going to expect fewer diet-related deaths in the future. But that's with no climate change. If we add in climate change, we still find that things are getting better, but the speed with which they're getting better is reduced. So from two million avoided deaths, it's about one and a half million avoided deaths. And then we can take the model and try and see what that half million is made up of, what is causing it. So I've taken that half million, just stretched it out, on the axes here, is there a, I can point, is, is there a, don't worry, don't worry, I can just point. So climate change will have both positive and negative effects on diets. So I'm going to put the positive effects below this line, the negative effects above the line, and if you subtract below the line from above the line, you'll get the yellow histogram there, yellow bar there. So again, what the model suggests is that fewer people in the presence of climate change will become obese or overweight, and fewer people 
will die because of the diseases associated with eating extra red meat. And most of these effects come because <coughs> climate change will affect production. For example, it will uh, affect the cost of feed. And it will make food more expensive, and especially the type of food we tend to transfer after we, go, after we, we become more wealthy and go through the nutritional, um, nutritional transition. The nutritional transition meaning that we begin to eat more fruit and vegetables and more meat. So what the model is able to do is to take these deaths and to ascribe them to different causes. And these are the good things that happen with climate change. So of the line, there are two major effects. First of all, and again, largely working through the price mechanism, fewer people are coming out of the, uh, the underweight category. And that's a bad thing. Again, food is expensive. The poorest people are having problems getting their calorie effect, getting their sufficient calories. The biggest effect, and actually the one we're least certain about, is fruit and vegetables. So all the epidemiological data is underlying the importance of fruit and vegetables to health. Now, fruit and vegetables is the hardest component for us to model. For two reasons. First of all, there's been generations of work on getting good crop models for wheat, rice, maize, etc. Far fewer for fruit and vegetables, both because there's been less attention and because there are so many more of them. But at least our estimate is that effects working through fruit and vegetable are going to be the most important effect of climate change on diets. But again, this is something that needs uh, to be challenged. Um, what we can also do is we can look at how those climate-related deaths are distributed uh, among different parts of the, the world. And interesting, a lot of them are based in um, Asia. And again, this is the effects going through fruit and, fruit and vegetables. So people who've come out of poverty and um, just at the cusp of how they can afford fruit and, fruit and vegetables. Uh, some of the some of the more positive bits are in South America, where fewer people are getting very high meat diets and reducing the levels of obesity. So that's the second question I was going to ask. And the final one is, what if we tax climate-unfriendly um, food? And again, this is a rather simplistic first pass at the problem. And I'm going to start off very simplistically and then try and add one elaboration in. So what we did was, and we used published a bit of our own life cycle analysis to, to assess greenhouse gas emissions of different food, uh, food types. And we introduced a proportionate tax uh, on that food. Now this is a really unrealistic part. We assume that proportionate tax was int introduced uniformly throughout the world. And that's the first thing I'm going to te tell you. And then we look for perverse effects and we redesign the tax intervention. And again, we're not trying to say that this is a normative <coughs> approach, that this is something that should be done, but we're trying to understand the space within which policy works. If this made no difference at all, then the lessons for policymakers would be don't think about taxes. If it makes a big difference, this is an area that is really worth policy attention even though you're never going to go all the way to this. And then I do recognize that this is a simplistic first step. So this is essentially what you get. Um, these are different food types along the base, which I'll read out just to save you uh, straining your necks. Beef, <laughs> oil, milk, lamb, poultry, a lot of um, animal source foods at the, at the uh, left here including oils, rice, wheat, pork, <coughs> maize. Interesting to pair pork with beef, eggs, oil crops, vegetables, sugar. I mean, I can't read any more without doing my neck in. <laughs> so if you put in this proportionate tax, this is the difference that it makes to price. There's blue histograms going above the line. So beef, we all know beef, uh, and we try to do it quite in, in a reasonably sophisticated way looking at precisely the production system for beef, not assume all beef is produced in the same way. 
If you were to tax it in relation to its greenhouse gas emissions, the price would go up maybe 40%. Then as you go down, oils would go up, milk, and so on, down to when you're getting to fruits and roots and legumes right at the end, it would make very little difference. And of course, you can adjust this so it's tax neutral. And then this is the difference that it makes to consumption. So the sort of proportional difference to consumption is less than the proportional increase in, uh, in price. But there still is a significant change in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in consumption. So that's the effects. What difference does it, it, it make um, to both health and to greenhouse gas emissions? So the bottom line, and I'll read it out to some people on the, on the uh, <coughs> left, is that about 100,000 fewer deaths will happen a year because of the knock-on effects on diets. So perhaps not a huge number, but still a significant number, 100K. What about the greenhouse gas emissions? Well, it predicts that greenhouse gas emissions will go down by gigatons. Now, I suspect that there are people in the audience who have a good, good feeling for what a gigaton is, and I don't. But what a gigaton is, it's about 10% of the reduction that's needed per year to keep the change in temperature below 2 degrees. So this is really quite a major contribution from the food system. The food system uh, produces 15% of the greenhouse gas emissions, 30% of you include the land clearing. And so include, in, including this tax with all the simpli simplifications would, would go 10% of the way to what's needed. Now, I blanked out the map because it has some very unsettling uh, aspects to it. So here's this is taking the 100K and saying, where are these 100K people? And the bright colors are where deaths actually go up. And the green yellow colors are where deaths go down. And so you add up the negatives and the positives, and that's where the 100K comes from. <coughs> And you can see that introducing this global uniform tax would increase food and lead to people dying in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Central African Republic. So clearly, ethically unconscionable. So what we then went back and said, well, let's actually try and fine tune it. For example, one could just not put these taxes on in least, least developed countries. So I won't go into the details of exactly what was done. But just look at these figures. So what we're going to do is we're going to fine tune this and look at the number of deaths that are avoided and the emissions. And so if you do a fine tuning, then the um, avoided deaths go up from 100 to 500. So essentially you're stopping the deaths happening in there. So you're getting a real increase in the health benefits. And the greenhouse gas emissions, well, you're paying a cost in greenhouse gas emissions, but the marginal cost is quite small. It was one gigaton before, 0.9 now, 0.9 now, and the figure from 100 to 5,000. So in this sort of obscene trade-off between health and environment, doing that fine-tuning is really quite, quite helpful. And again, I do realize this is highly simplistic, and I think the policy message from this is that if one was able to get this fiscal intervention right or use a different type of intervention, then there is the potential for a lot of action that is beneficial to both health and to the environment. So those were the three questions I wanted to ask. The second part of the talk, which is very short, and again, is just to sort of try and stimulate discussion, is what are the science priorities? What, what do we need to do? And I've sort of put it... I've classified it as we, we did in the Foresight Report I was involved with about eight years ago, production side, consumption side, waste and governance. And on the production side, I, I'm, forgive me, I'm going to use two sort of slightly cliched bus terms, but I think there is real meat behind these bus terms. And one is sustainable intensification. Um, my view is that we have to act on all these different components. We have to reduce waste. We have to get governance right. 
We have to do something about consumption. We have to do something about production. We do not have the luxury to do one and not the other. On the production side, well, if we're to produce more food, we could do it in two ways. We could bring more land into production, or we could grow more land from the, from the land we have already. As Nick Stern said in his report a few years back, the best way to get CO2 into the atmosphere is to cut down forests and convert them into agriculture, to drain swamps and, get them and convert them into agriculture. There surely is an argument for trying to get more production from our existing footprint. And I think sustainable intensification is a wonderful rubric to, to, to do that. I very much like Gordon Conway's in the audience dissection of sustainable intensification and how one does it. There's genetic intensification. We need to breed, do better plant breeding, better livestock breeding. In my view, and you may disagree, that should include GM. But you could, you'll be hard, but you could do it without GM. You need ecological intensification. Get the precision agriculture right. Get the agroecology right. That will all help. And then you need market intensification. You need to get, especially in low and developing countries, you need to get the the investment, hey, but the, you need to get infrastructure, you need to get the investment, you need to get the financial services that can support agricultural development. I'm also a great believer in multifunctional landscapes, especially in high income countries, in Europe, in North America. We have a narrative, we have a myth about our agricultural land produces food and fiber, and that's it. We need to do many other things. The land produces many things, many, you can call them ecosystem services. We need to think about these multifunctional landscapes. You will have seen from the Boris Johnson slide that I'm not an enthusiastic Brexiter. But were there a silver lining about Brexit, it is that we can experiment in trying to get things right. If we could get the way we support our rural economies right sort of post cap then there is some real opportunities there. On the consumption side, and this is, we're heavily involved with this in Oxford at, at the moment, how do we persuade people to change <coughs> their, their diets? How can we get better diets? We're going to have to do this if you just look at some of the issues with obesity. We have an impoverished set of interventions to do that, and we have a poor evidence base in order to do that. We put disproportionate <coughs> investment into cure rather than prevention. And when it comes to chronic diseases, we need to understand that much, much better. And I think there are some real opportunities with novel foods. And I wouldn't have said this even five years ago. And I hate the word disruption, which is just thrown around <coughs> far too often. But I suspect we may be on the threshold of disruption in the food system for some of the novel foods that are healthier alternatives to some food types, including, including meat. I'm going to say very little about, about waste. Don't think it's a silver bullet or a low-hanging fruit. There are complex behavioral and economic issues around waste, but yet it needs a lot of attention. It's ludicrous that we waste, well, even the statistics are bad, but most people say we waste a third of our food. We really don't know if that's right, but clearly there are things that are happening there. And I want to finish by governance and stress testing the global food system. And this is the last part of my talk and the bit that sort of keeps me awake at night. So I want to start with a couple of statistics that, that many of you would be very familiar with, but then I want to put them together. And this is some USDA data about the percentage income of, that people spend on food and alcohol. And so there's the US down there with about 8% of income spent on food. We're about 9%. Um, and then if you go up to, and this is a sort of fairly random selection of countries, but you go up to countries in sub-Saharan Africa, Belarus is up there as well, then you're up to 40 or 50% of income is spent in food. And you know, with us in North America and Europe, probably at no time in history, has a society spent less of its income on food that we do, than we do today? Which has all sorts of ramifications for how we view food and how we view the political priority 
of food. I keep meaning to change this slide because whenever people look at it, they ignore the food data and they look at the um, alcohol data. Why do we drink more than the States? Did, did you know we drank more than France? I mean, we'd all assume the French drank more than us. And what's happening with Hungary? <laughs> the country should be called thirsty. <laughs> Sorry, I think there might have been a Hungarian <laughs> in the audience there. Moving swiftly on. Here's another trend, which again you'll be familiar with. And this is the fraction of the global population living in, in cities. I think I mentioned this earlier. About 2007, we went through 50% uh, of the world um, living in cities. It'll be two thirds by the end of, uh, uh, by the middle of this century. I, I mean, it's amazing even in my lifetime, and I'm old but not that old, just going to Africa and seeing the growth of, 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 of cities. And in fact, the next slide shows that. These are the cities that are over half a million with the coal colours, those that are not growing, and the hot colours, those that are growing. And look at sub-Saharan Africa. Big, big cities. Some of them 10, billion, uh, sorry, 10 million people and still rapidly going, growing. So we have this um, burgeoning city uh, burgeoning cities. And then the final sort of thing I want to mention, the, these sort of three facts, a fraction of uh, our income we spend on food, global cities, and this is developing country serial trade. So this is data from FAO of a few years back. So if you, if you take the developing countries and you look at the cereals, so the exporting nations, and you would think that especially low income developing income countries with a comparative advantage, often in land, certainly in labour prices, that they would be major commodity exporters. And some certainly are. That's data up to now and an extrapolation to mid-century. But look at the importing countries. So the block of low and uh, uh, low and middle income countries, low income countries in particular, are major, major net imports of commodities and are likely to be to mid-century. And we all hope, and people like Gordon have spent their lives trying to help developing countries becoming more efficient in agriculture. And it will happen, but the growth in agricultural production has to be higher than population growth. And for the foreseeable future, there are going to be major, major importers of grain. And so they rely on global commodity markets to supply, um, to supply their, 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 their peoples. Now, in the past, if that has gone wrong, with a majority rural population, then rural people can, to a certain extent, buffer themselves against uh, famine, using famine foods. I mean, it's horrible food, but there is some buffering. And if they don't, and if they really sadly die, then to a certain extent they die invisibly. And of course the West wakes up in the end, but a lot of people die. Now this is not what happens when the majority of the rural population are urban. There's very little buffering, and um, they run out of food, and they're on the streets, and they immediately cause social and political disruption. This is just the graph I showed you earlier about the FA food price index. And there have been a couple of analyses who have tried to correlate the volatility with um, civil unrest. And this is work from Bar Yam's group at Boston University, who who've essentially ju just had a pass and so look where there has been civil disturbance. Some explicitly linked to food, but others not. And you can see that there is a strong correlation. You can sort of worry about the statistics and special correlation, but essentially it's still a strong correlation. So what, it, what this says to me is that there is a really major um, issue if, if we get the governance of the global food system uh, wrong. And it's interesting that if you look at the, how the global commodity system is governed, it, it's, it's largely in the hands of a relatively small number of companies. 
And this may be absolutely fine. I'm not saying there's a problem. But these actually tend to be private, to, uh, privately owned companies as well. So their reporting requirements are not like if they were a publicly owned company. And to me, this is a real argument for doing stress testing of the global food system. Doing the type of things that if you were a banker, you wish had been done in the banking sector in the year 2000 or 2002. Because were we to get this right, we would see some of the tragedies that have been played out on our television screens for the last 10, or, uh, last 10 years or so. These are some of the migrants coming through the Balkans and trying, the poor people trying to get across the Mediterranean and many dying on the way. And the tragedies that we've seen over the last 10 years would be as of nothing if we seriously had problems in some of the big megacities in sub-Saharan Africa. So to me, it's, that's what keeps me awake at night. And it might be I'm wrong to be kept awake at night, but I'd like to be reassured. I'd like to see a systematic stress testing of the global food system. And you know, I'm actually quite optimistic in the long term about getting food right. I'm very worried in these, the, our resilience to what are often human-induced uh, perturbations in the short term. So I think I've got my, yes. So this is my last slide now. And uh, it's, it's sort of some rough conclusions. I think the food system is entering into uncharted waters. We have these major drivers, not only population, but urbanization, climate change. Um, there are things we can do and we know will work. And many of them, interestingly, have co-benefits, have both health and environmental benefits. So I think there's a lot we can do. We know, we know what we have to do. You know, in a way, natural scientists have done their job. We need more social science work into how we can actually implement it. My last point is that we, think we should think seriously about the resilience of the global food system. And then my final point is this. So my background is a population biologist, and I'm actually a biodiversity biologist. Passionately about biodiversity, as I know some of you do. Others will care about human rights. Others will care about other things. And we should continue to care about these things. But all of us should care about food, because if we fail on food, we then fail on everything. Thanks very much. Um, I think we have time for a few questions, uh, a few minutes or so, so um, put your hands up and I'm sure shots. Especially people from this side of the audience. Yeah, too, exactly. Can I, yes, let me start off. I, I, I didn't really understand the role of fruit and vegetables in that climate change diagram that you had. I couldn't, I couldn't quite get that. But more importantly, I, because I'm a bit of an optimist, when you talked about sustainable intensification, I don't think it's just about markets, it's about the whole value chain, and it's about linking farmers into value chains. So it goes all the way up from the farm and the food processing and so on and so forth. And in Africa, we know that maize farmers only get about less than one ton per hectare. And we know that Many of them, I've seen many of them, get four, five, six tons per hectare with a drought tolerant maize variety and a blended fertilizer and micronutrients of that, which is not what's used at the moment. If you do put all those things together, they get five, six. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in mm -hmm. Ethiopia, I've seen mm -hmm. it in uh, uh, Mozambique, and so on. But for that to happen, they need the value chain links and the financing so that they can afford to buy the new seed varieties and the new uh, blended fertilizers. And I think if you do that, then food production in Africa can increase really quite dramatically. And I think that's one of the big issues. So, so let me answer your first point first, and one about fruit and vegetables. Yeah. So there is increasingly strong epidemiological evidence of positive health effects of better fruit and vegetables. Right. And what our model says, and I, I did say that this is the part of the model that we think needs the greatest challenge, 
is that the effect, uh, and again, as you know, fruit and vegetable tends, tends to be much more water demanding right. than, and much more susceptible to environmental yeah. things. Yeah. So yeah. that's the effect that climate change we have on, we think it has on the model. Now your wow. second point about the components of sustainable intensification, I'm going to be very cheeky because mm. I thought your concept of market intensification included all the things that you've just said. So sort of getting the economic infrastructure, the, the physical infrastructure and the economic infrastructure right for, uh, to enable that to happen. And I think there's a really interesting thing, I, I think you've contributed this to, to this debate, about how you can actually help uh, the farmers to be able to get that small amount of fertilizers and things. And whether we're concentrating too much on microcredit and whether we need to sort of think about how one can get the next stage banking sector just... Uh, um well, all I'm really objecting to is if you just think about it as being marketing, it then it's becomes not, an economic yes. finance model. And yes. I think it's a hell of a lot more than that. Yes. Uh, so I, I completely agree with you. And perhaps I was using the term wrong. And I, I just got back from Ethiopia. and I. For the first time that in an African country that I've been to, seeing in the smallest towns, then branches of banks, we're actually yeah. having people yeah. in these small towns who have the agronomic yeah. skills to be able to help to yeah. invest. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why yeah. Ethiopia has been a relatively success story in the 20 years. I, I tell you, it's very scary giving a talk and fruit in front of Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say anything more. <laughs> please do, please do. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question. Um, I mean, um, I really like the, the first part about what if we eat um, healthily. Um, but I got, and I, I would be very happy if we would all follow these WHO recommendations. Um, but coming to your science priorities and then how do we persuade um, people to change their diets, I was a bit wondering. Um, <coughs> Well, how is this actually happening? Or whether you took, um, taken into account the role of industry in that? Um, I know um, there is like a recent study which unfortunately brings um, the UK on, uh, top, uh, on, on number one of the unhealthiest diets. And I think this is due to um, the... That, that's within Europe, isn't it? That's within we Europe, don't want yeah. We do the <laughs> honour with some North Americans in the room. Germany is not so don't worry. <laughs> but um, mm. no, we should actually worry because yes. it's... Um, I think we've just overtaken you as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that you mm. always be on top of But it's about the highly processed foods. Yes. So I was wondering whether you, you have an idea about like the role of industry for the future and or whether you've taken that into account in your calculations or? So in the modeling, uh, and again, I stress the simplicity, we have just assumed diets change. So <coughs> we're not saying how it's changed. In a lot of the work we're doing at the moment, we're trying to ask how can diets change? And of course, the political easy answer is that we'll educate people, we'll do labeling. And there is an increasing evidence base showing that that makes relatively little difference. It, it does help, but it makes the most difference to people, you know, middle class people who are health conscious rather than at population levels. And you're exactly right. It's, it's, it's part of what I'm saying uh, about the need for social science and political science work. I mean, exactly power balances and power structures are really important. Um, I'm slightly pessimistic in the short term in that I see little possibility of change until we as individuals, so not as scientists, but just we as individuals and citizens, almost legitimise our governments to be able to take harder decisions, both in fiscal regulatory and in, and in confronting industry. Um, this has happened in the past. I mean, look at tobacco. I mean, I, I joke to my students that the two most amazing things that have happened in my adult lifetime is a demographic transition, why I'm much more optimistic age 59 than I was when I was your age, and the fact you can't smoke in a restaurant in Berlin. Who would have thought that would have happened uh, 30 years? We, uh, I mean, for someone my age, it's extraordinary. And that happened because civil society legitimized government to do things that were impossible to imagine even 30 years ago. 
Now, food isn't the same as tobacco. You know, tobacco is an unremitting bad, and food is both good and bad. So it's much more complex. But we need to understand better the complex power relationships that you've talked about. And understanding it better will be helpful, but I don't see action happening until civil society moves sufficiently to legitimise governments to do things. Martin. I was um, interested in the association that you had between obesity and, and climate change. So it all eats better, as I understood it. Um, uh, even without climate change, actually, we, we get uh, <coughs> less obese with climate change. Did I have that right? Is that, that right? Yes, so one of the problems with obesity is that as people become wealthier, they buy, um, they buy more calorific, right. rich food, including meat. It's a complex relation that depends very much on the society you're, you're in. So it happens in different ways. And climate change, which is largely bad, slows that down. But the, the thing that's confusing me is that climate change, is, you could argue, is caused <coughs> by middle class uh, consumption. And a large part of that would be their, their diet. And so the very cause of climate change, you would imagine, is, is feeding ourselves, overfeeding ourselves, causing more obesity. In fact, the last we've had climate change, yeah. both a degree of yeah. warming, and we've got fatter, not, not thinner. Yes, but we've got even fatter without climate change. Right. So that's what the model right. would suggest. So, so it's not just so it should be below the line, actually. It should be. Uh, so that particular statistic should be below the line. So um, as incomes have gone up, then that has had many effects that have led to 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 uh, to um, greater emissions. And then one of the consequences of that has been feeding has been. Oh, is it possible? At least the feedback that has meant that as incomes have gone up, then because of the effects on greenhouse gas emissions, then the increase in the consumption of meat and other things hasn't been quite as much as you would expect otherwise. Does that make sense? It, yeah, but less, so it's bad, but it would have been even worse. Yes, yes. yes. Sorry. Uh, I was interested in your, um, your uh, study where you looked at uh, taxation and then you adjusted to try and get to a zero net deaths per country if possible. So I was just wondering if that factored in the fact that obviously within a country there's a spread of wealth. So w the dangerous question is whether it would, it would reduce the deaths in the richer and increase the deaths in the poorer parts of society within a relatively rich country, so I was just wondering if that was factored no. into Now that's an discussion. excellent question. And um, we did a fudge with Gini coefficients, right. which we know is a fudge, and in the next version of the model we are going to try and partition into three income groups so we can try and dissect that. Okay. So you're perfectly right in pointing out that we so, so we haven't ignored it but we sort of fudged it with a with the Gini coefficient. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned how obviously diet, waste, major drivers in terms of the challenges we face. Have you taken your research much out to the public, to, to civil society organisations?